Hello everyone, Gaku here. A while ago I was streaming, and someone hopped into the stream and said, Hey Gaku, have you ever considered making a video about Victoria 3 and ideas you think should or could be implemented in it? The short answer, of course, was no, because I never made that video and never really thought about it. But I thought this was a really good question and actually deserved a video. In preparing to make this video, I fired up Victoria 1, and I'd forgotten just how many features from Victoria 1 never made it into Victoria 2. And some of these are actually important features. Now, I didn't want to make a video that's just, you know, a list of things that Victoria 1 is better than Victoria 2. Because I want to move forward. I want to say, here's Victoria 2, here's a good game, what can we do to make it better? And as some of you are aware, about a decade ago I spent a good bit of time, was my primary hobby was developing and programming video games. So, small amateur games, didn't really make any money off of them, but that was just what I did. So I put on my developer hat, and thought, what can we do to make Victoria 2 a better game? Let's talk a bit about Victoria 3. See, in the groups that I play with, there are two common sentiments. One of these is that Victoria 3 is likely to become a DLC nightmare in the vein of E4 or CK2. And the other is that Victoria 3 is likely to be a watered down, essentially E4 clone with uh, mana points and just a gutted version of Victoria 2. So neither one of those is really a good thing and neither one of those are what I'm trying to design. Let's take a great functioning game like Victoria 2, build upon it and adapt it in order to make a better game. Now when I started making my list for Victoria 3, there was something I realized. You spread across all the different Paradox games, there are common features and there are unique features. And a lot of the unique features from earlier games didn't make it into later games, and some features are unique to one series or another. But if you take these different features, which are all possible within the Klauswitz engine, and then put them together, you can make one fantastic game. So that's the theme here, is I'm going to take features from all these different games and put them together into what I think is a really fantastic game. And just as I said with my EU3 versus EU4 video, this is my list and, you know, you're welcome to disagree, but this is just what I would do if I were developing Victoria 3. In no particular order, let's get started with the list. Number 1. Graphics. Graphics are literally the least important thing to me. In my notes, I have this subheading labeled as don't care. Let's be honest, graphics and processing power has improved a lot since 2010, so the graphics are going to be updated. If the game looks gorgeous, fantastic. But the number one thing that I care about is gameplay and especially mechanics, so let's move on. Number 2. 64-bit. Anyone who's played a large mod for Paradox game, for example Mayu and Taxes for EU4, has felt the pain of running a 32-bit game in the modern era. So we're just going to assume right off the bat that Victoria 3 is going to be 64-bit. There's absolutely no reason for it not to be. Now with that out of the way, there's a common misconception that Victoria 2 is both single-core and single-threaded, but that's not the case. In preparing to make this video, I went back and tested all of the Paradox games that I had, and I found that even as far back as Victoria 1, that game was running with 19 threads. Victoria 2 uses 26 threads, although they do appear to be on a single core. Now for the Klauswitz engine games, these appear to have between 55 and 58 threads, and at least for two of them, there does appear to be multi-core support. I couldn't confirm that with Hoi4 or Stellaris, but that might have just been my testing methodology. It does appear that EU4 and CK2 are multi-core. But I am going to assume that Victoria 3 is going to be multi-threaded, at least to the point of the Klauswitz games, and if possible that it's going to be multi-core. I don't have Impure to Rome, I have no interest in getting that game, so it's possible it might function a hell of a lot better than any of the ones that I tested. But I'm going to assume that Victoria 3 is going to run with at least the computational efficiency of a game like EU4. Number 3. Division Designer. As inspired by... Toy 4. If you have ever watched me play multiplayer Victoria 2, and I'm playing a relatively large nation, you've probably seen me spend well over half my time just organizing units. And this is not fun or interesting, you know, taking units, splitting them off, it's never, uh, it's never an even split, so you have to split off exactly the right number, move them to the right place, and then reorganize once your units get where they're going. You have to get rid of the extra ones, oh look, a Hussar, I need one of those, let's move him up. This sort of thing is not interesting, this shit's gotta go. And let's not forget when you have individual brigades rebel against you, you have to then find those stacks and replace those units wherever they happen to be in the world. Let's get this system and replace it with something that works. We're going to use the Division Designer from Hoi4. A system like this will make unit management way easier in Victoria 3. So instead of having to track down and manually organize your individual brigades, you just have all your battalions in predefined formations 
Then you just build them by the type of division that you want. Remember how in Victoria 2 there's no way to tell the difference between a stack containing guards and a stack containing regulars? Well how about we give players the option to very easily differentiate between them? This should not be that difficult. Number 4. Line Management As inspired by Toy 4 As we progress through the Victoria timeline we get further and further into the age of trench warfare. And what this means in a practical sense as far as line management is concerned is that we've got more land to cover, we've got more brigades to deal with, and we've got more divisions to micromanage. In some extreme cases, for example Russia, we might have well over a thousand brigades that we have to micromanage. So let's dispense with that headache and take another page from the Hoi 4 playbook. Now I think this is pretty straightforward, but the general idea is that you should be able to assign fronts and then assign units to it. And this is especially true for your rank and file defensive units. There's no reason that you should be forced to micromanage every single division that you have in the world. Now conceptually, there's no reason why some of the other line management features from Hoi 4 couldn't be implemented. For example, automating attacks either aggressively or carefully, um, setting spearheads and offensive lines, etc. And even fallback lines, this sort of thing. There's no reason this can't be automated to some degree in Victoria 3. Now the extent to which it should be automated, that's debatable. But at least for lines, just standard lines with defensive troops, there's absolutely no reason that shouldn't be automated to some degree. Number 5. Mobilization and Reserves As inspired by Hoi 3 so I've already talked about the division designer from Hoi 4 and how that could be a massive help to Victoria 3. Let's talk about mobilization specifically. Mobilization in Victoria 2 is a nightmare. And the larger your nation becomes, the more of a nightmare it becomes. So basically we've got all of our units coming together in a haphazard manner. They're being uh, recruited at different times, they're coming together at different rates. You have to sort of organize them, you have to split them off, usually in 12 stacks, but you know, it, uh, it varies by your stack compositions. You have to have your other stacks organized in meaningful ways. Obviously these are not because I just loaded up 1836. But trying to make meaningful stacks out of your mobilized units is a huge pain. And uh, you can do it well or you can do it poorly, but whatever you do, it's uh, going to be not a lot of fun. This is not a fun part of the game. So how about we just improve this? Let's take a working mobilization system from a game that does it well and incorporate it into Victoria 3. And my pick for the game that does it best is the Hoi 3 reserve system. Now the Hoi 3 division designer is a little bit different but basically it goes like this. You assign your brigades however you like and then after you're done you mark them as reserves. And what this does is it drastically reduces the cost to produce it and the manpower cost. And once that division is ready it gets placed on the map just like any other division, except it's not going to be at its full strength. And if you want that reserve unit to increase to its full strength, you have to mobilize. After you mobilize, that unit will slowly increase to its full strength. The notable thing though is that you don't have to reorganize any of your units to do this. Your unit's just on the map, it's going to be in the same place, and then slowly over time as your mobilization takes place, it's going to tick up to full strength. This is way more convenient than the Victoria 2 system. In Victoria 3, we want to reduce the amount of pointless micromanagement. So instead of having to deal with those hundreds of extra brigades that just materialize out of nowhere, how about we already have them organized the way we want them in advance, and then we just let them tick up to full strength once we mobilize. Way easier to deal with and less hassle that way. Additionally, this reserve system addresses the Victoria 2 cheese strat of locking your units onto those specific provinces where the enemy is going to be mobilizing, and then stack wiping the units as they appear. As far as incorporating your reserves into your army, I'm imagining this on a per battalion basis. If this is, for example, your standard infantry division, you know, your basic line unit, you might say, for example, that two-thirds of it consists of reserves, or you might say that just a third of it is reserves, but really, that, that should be up to you. The key here is that your reserves should be incorporated into your army and not require unreasonable amounts of micromanagement to deal with once you mobilize. Number 6 Tiered Mobilization System, as inspired by Toy 4. While we're on the topic of mobilization, there's no reason that mobilization has to be all or nothing. And in fact, I would say that your war policy should determine your maximum mobilization unless you're at war. A jingoist government might be able to full mobilize when not at war, but a pro-military government might only be able to get 75% mobilization when not at war. 
But if someone has a CB against you, and if they are mobilizing, then you should be able to mobilize to at least their level. So if a pro-military nation has a CB against you, and you're anti-military, and you see that that pro-military nation is mobilized, they can get to 75% because they're not at war yet. Well, because they have a CB against you and they're mobilized, you can also mobilize to 75%. But neither one of you can go to 100 until the war starts. I think limiting mobilization in this way would add some nuance and allow for some interesting strategies when nations with different war policies go to war with one another. Number 7. Manpower-Based Militaries As inspired by Victoria 1 In Victoria 2, each brigade is supported by a distinct pop. And the population of the various soldier pops in a province determines how many brigades you can get out of that province. However, this wasn't the case in Victoria 1. In Victoria 1, there was a cap on the number of units of any particular culture that you could draw, but they weren't tied directly to the soldier pops that they originated from. I'll give you an example. If we go to manpower, we see that there are four possible North German brigades. And of those four, I found that they all come from two provinces. There's about 11,000 soldiers in this province, and there's about 29,000 in this province. But if we go to the military management, set up new division, if I set the culture to North German, you can see that I can set the home province as either of the two provinces. And in fact, all of the soldiers can be set in either of these provinces. The soldiers of this culture originate in these two pops, but they're not tied to either of these two provinces necessarily. We get to pick which of our provinces we want to tie to. If we use South German, there are six possible, and we can see that there are six provinces that they can be tied to but all of them can be tied to any one of these six provinces. So there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation between soldier pops and soldiers the way there is in Victoria 2. So although this one-to-one -one relationship is something that people are used to in Victoria 2, I don't consider it to be a sacred cow, and I think it's something that should be changed. So we can get rid of the system and go back to a more decentralized manpower system. Not necessarily the same as Victoria 1, but maybe more like Hoi 4 where we have one manpower pool based on our soldier pops, and the contribution of soldier pops of unaccepted cultures could be determined based on our citizenship policy. If we're going to a manpower-based system, then force limit it becomes unnecessary, so this can be removed entirely. And then the size of our military is determined, number one, by our soldier pops, and also by whether or not we can supply them with enough goods to let them fight effectively. Number eight, military equipment as inspired by Toy 4. One of my disappointments with Victoria 2 is that for the hundred years that this game spans, there's hardly any indication of the massive improvements in arms and military technology during this time period. Most of the advancement in Victoria 2 is represented with modifiers, whether that's through the individual techs and what they provide, or the inventions that are based off of them. Let's be honest, this is not interesting. A plus one here, a plus 0.5 there, a plus 5% here or a plus 50% there, it's not that interesting. And I think this is even more obvious if you look at the military tab. For about 80% of the game, you have access to these specific brigade types, and that's it. These brigade types don't change throughout the course of the game. I mean, they get modifiers, but a plus 5 infantry versus a plus 8 infantry, it's still just an infantry unit. It's the same unit. You can have that same unit all the way through the game with no effective changes to that unit, right? I don't find that to be interesting, and I think we can improve on that. And again, I'm looking at Hoi 4, specifically in terms of weapons production and customizing unit loadouts. Hoi 4 does a fantastic job of depicting arms advancement over a 10-year period. Well, in Victoria, we've got 10 times longer, and we've got a lot of advancement that can be shown there, too. Each weapon type should have its own stockpile, so if you want to stay up to date with the technology, you've outfitted all your troops, well, it's going to cost you a lot. Or do you keep producing the older weapons, which are now cheap and in abundant supply? Or do you sell off your older weapons? Or do you put them on the market? Or do you maybe just give them to your ally that's behind technologically? These are all things you should be able to do. As far as the variation, there are hundreds of possibilities. I mean, just look at YouTube. There are channels that just focus on weapons from the era. There's so much possibility there, and I would love to see that in Victoria 3. Intermission. At this point, you might be saying to yourself, Hey, Gaku, it sounds like you just want to take... Hoi 4 and relabel it Victoria 3. And I can see why you would say that because I have been referring to Hoi 4 quite a bit. The reason I'm coming to Hoi 4 is there are some things that this game does exceptionally well. 
and rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, I think that as a baseline it would be a good idea to incorporate those specific aspects. In every Paradox game, there are individual things which are broken, but often these same things have been fixed in other games. And I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of the issues that Victoria 2 has have been fixed in Hoi 4 because the time periods are so close to each other and especially late in Victoria, the style of warfare is very similar between the two. So keep that in mind as we go along. Number 9. Line Battles and Trench Warfare As inspired by Victoria 1 This next one's going to be a bit tricky in part because I haven't quite figured it out myself. Now in Victoria 2 we have line battles. It's essentially the same as what you see in EU4. We've got units moving into positions, we've got flanking, we've got uh, artillery in the background, sometimes we've got units out of position. You know, in a, in a battle, in a line battle this makes sense. Now, uh, you know, in the up to the mid 1800s, sure, it makes sense, okay. After that, and especially once we get into the era of trench warfare, this makes no sense. Now, if you've ever seen one of these mega battles in Victoria 2 where, you know, you've got a million troops on each side, just constant cycling, you know, I mean, you can do it. But uh, if you look at the individual brigades within the armies, their positioning makes no sense. And this is especially demonstrated by the artillery on the front line, which there isn't any right now because this battle just started. But in these long battles, you'll have your units cycling through and then, oh, hey, your artillery is on the front. Are you telling me you somehow broke through three lines of trenches, the enemy didn't notice and pull their artillery back? It just makes no sense. I mean, this is the era of creeping barrages, it's the era of slow and methodical attacks. Um, this, this sort of thing just doesn't happen in this era. So, something needs to change between the early game and the late game in the way battles are conducted. And I'm not sure exactly what. But something needs to change, and it's not increased defensive modifiers, because yes, defense is part of it, but the way that battles are conducted needs to be changed. And this is the part I haven't figured out yet. As I said just a second ago, late game Victoria 2 has a lot more in common conceptually with Hoi than it does with EU. And again, I'm not sure how to show that. I've, I've considered if maybe it would be better to use a Hoi style system where, you know, walking into a province is what uh, initiates the combat and where walking from multiple provinces would initiate multiple attacks. That's a possibility. I'm not sure what would be the best system here, but I know that this is not the right system. Now for comparison, let me pull up Victoria 1. So here we have a battle in Vic 1. I just had some rebels spawn on top of me. And as you might see, this is actually more reminiscent of, of a Hoi game. You've got, uh, you've got your strength, you've got your organization, and as time passes, that's going to tick down on both sides, and we'll see what happens. There's another battle. Again, very reminiscent of, uh, of a Hoi game. And what I want to show here is uh, not that this is necessarily a better system, but it is a more abstracted system. And uh, it's one, I, I believe it's essentially the same one we see in Hoi. You know, of course, we're moving on to the province before attacking, which is a bit different. And if you're attacking an actual uh, enemy nation in Victoria 1, then you'll see that their organization tends to drop well before their strength. So usually armies will be retreating rather than dying as they do when they're rebels. But... Um, it's just an example of a more abstracted system, and uh, I think this system might be more suitable in the late game. But in any case, line battles just don't make sense in the late game. But um, I think that's something that would just have to be tested and tweaked, you know? So try something out, see how well it works, and then change it as needed. If I were to take one single system and apply it to all of Victoria 3, I'd have to say the Victoria 1 system. But I, I think maybe a hybrid system would be the way to go. So in early game Victoria 3, use the Victoria 2 line battle system. It makes sense. And then later throughout the game, as it progresses, maybe change, maybe change the system into one that's uh, more fitting for trench warfare. Because line battles, at least as represented in Victoria 2, not the best representation of what was actually happening during the Great War. Number 10. Forts as inspired by EU4. Forts in Victoria 2 are cheap, generic, and ubiquitous. 
And none of those are things that should be characteristic of forts as far as I'm concerned. Forts should be game changers and important. So I'm going to give you my concept for a Victoria 3 fort. A Victoria 3 fort, depending on the fort level and the tech of course, is going to be a massive investment. That is, resources, money, and manpower. And then even after you've built it, it's going to require upkeep in resources, money, and manpower. Which means you're not going to spam your entire country with forts because you'd be an idiot to do that. You're going to put your forts in those key provinces that you've determined you need to hold at all costs. And ones that have strategic value for other reasons. We're going to borrow the E4 fort pop under. Which is that if an enemy is sieging your fort and then you walk onto the province, you're going to pop under them and uh, be on the defensive. Because it's silly otherwise that they're attacking your fort and you're attacking them, but somehow they're on the defense. That doesn't really make sense, so we're going to borrow that aspect. But we're not going to borrow the zone of control, so encircling a fort is very much possible, just as it was in real life. Now, forts in this case are going to provide three distinct bonuses. Number one, a massive defensive bonus on the province that contains the fort. Well, let's just assume we have a fort here in Breslau, and I don't have the uh, proper icon for it, so we'll just make it a factory. Anyway, that fort is also going to have an impact on adjacent provinces in the following way. Let's say we're playing as Prussia and we're, we're at war with Russia. If Russia occupies this province, and this province is adjacent to this fort, and then they attack into any of these three provinces, because they're attacking from a province next to a fort, the defensive will get a bonus in these three provinces. Whereas if they just attack directly without being adjacent to the fort, they won't get the defensive bonus. If the Russians are here and we're attacking into that province from any of the four adjacent provinces, we'll get an offensive bonus courtesy of the adjacent fort. So basically, having a fort is going to give you bonuses on any adjacent province unless you're being attacked from a province that isn't adjacent to the fort. Now, because forts are purpose-built to defend in very specific ways, uh, an occupied enemy fort should probably have some sort of penalty, maybe 50%, maybe 75%. As fort provinces are attacked, they should become damaged and become less efficient, requiring repairs. If they take enough damage, they could be reduced to rubble and rendered ineffective or even completely destroyed. The goal here is to make forts more impactful in a number of ways. First, by having a more profound impact on nearby battles, which you'd expect from a strong fortified position in the vicinity. Second, by serving as a sort of rally point for counter-offensives, which I hope you can see by the uh, bonuses going into the adjacent provinces. So. Um, it should be very difficult to kick an enemy out of a region with an occupied fort. The flip side is that it should be very expensive to maintain. And also to provide some additional strategic considerations when it comes to things like line placement. Like do you really want to have your line right up next to that enemy fort? Where they're going to be more vulnerable than if they were say an additional province away. A few other caveats in case you've already thought of them. Uh, I do think that forts should exert influence into enemy territory. So if you have a fort here, and if we're attacking into this province from either of these two, then you should get that offensive bonus, because there's a fort here. If, on the other hand, we have forts, uh, let's say, here and here, then this would effectively cancel out that offensive bonus, because if we're attacking this way, we're attacking from one province adjacent to a fort into another, or if we're attacking this way, we're attacking from this province adjacent to a fort into another, so basically our offensive bonus gets cancelled out by the defensive bonus in this case. And second, uh, whether you are starting and ending next to the same enemy fort or are starting and ending next to two different forts, I don't think that should really matter. I think it's just the fact that you are uh, in the vicinity of enemy forts at both positions is the uh, important thing. And I think uh, that should give the uh, defensive bonuses in either case. So that's for forts. As far as local fortifications and trench warfare in the late game, I really think that should be represented by a unit's dig-in stat and not by uh, manual construction. So, you know, clicking on provinces and manually pressing the build fort button, that's not an interesting or fun part of the game. Uh, so, like I said, forts should be impactful and not the way they are in Victoria 2. Number 11, combat modifiers, as inspired by Victoria 1. I've already talked about line battles and why they're not a great system in Victoria 2. But let's talk about combat modifiers. 
I brought two stacks together to attack the Texans. And as you can see, there's just not a whole lot going on here. If we attack from one province or two provinces or five provinces, it's all the same, really. So we have one line against the opposing enemy line. We've got a dig-in penalty, we've got a crossing penalty, but aside from that, nothing here is really unique. I might surprise you that this is not the case in Victoria 1. We attack this rebel stack from two directions. And see Victoria 1 gives a flanking bonus. The reason I bring this up is because it has such a huge impact on the way late game Victoria 2 plays out. In late game Victoria 2, especially multiplayer, what you usually have are just walls of units staring at each other. And the reason why is because it doesn't matter how many troops you throw in or how many directions they attack from, it all gets treated the same as if it's a line battle. Now, in Victoria 1, that's not the case. If this were Victoria 1 and Brazil were to attack from three directions, it'd get that flanking bonus and do more damage to me. I think this makes a lot of sense, and the more provinces that you attack from, it should realistically have an impact on the person that you're attacking. If this were incorporated into Victoria 2, it would completely change the tactics of both defending a line and attacking from a line. Because rather than looking for those provinces that you can funnel all your troops through a single province and attack into it, you'd instead be looking for provinces that you can attack from multiple directions. And the same would be true on the defense. You'd be defending those positions that are most exposed, and it would also serve as a more meaningful alternative to the never-ending battles that you see in multiplayer games. Whether this is in the context of a Vic-1 style system, or a Hoi style system, or even Vic-2's combat system, I don't think it really matters which, but the important thing is that uh, these sorts of combat modifiers allow for greater variability and more strategy when it comes to planning your individual attacks. And uh, that's just the most obvious example is attacking from multiple directions. But there are other possible additions that could be made. For example, um, in the era of trench warfare, there's options for scouts. Uh, obviously, there's options for scouts through the entire game. Uh, reconnaissance, these could be separate from the battles, as an example. Uh, sort of like the planning phases of Hoi 4. I think you, you should reasonably be able to plan your attacks before you make them in Victoria 3, and I think this should all be incorporated in the combat modifiers that play out in the actual battles. Number 12. Rebellions, as inspired by Victoria 1 and PDM Divide by Zero for Victoria 2. Before moving on from land units and combat, I wanted to talk about rebellions. There are a few different things I dislike about this system. Uh, the first has to do with Victoria 2's fort spam. So, as forts get higher and higher level, the odds of rebels actually occupying anything decreases to almost zero. And even with the very large stacks, it's very unlikely that a rebellion is going to succeed just because it's going to take them so long to occupy, and it takes uh, no real effort to stack by all the rebels in your country. Second, I think the rebellions are very underpowered. I know that in the logic of the game, we have professional armies fighting uh, essentially untrained civilians, but I do think the rebels need a buff. And uh, one of my favorite mods, which is uh, Pop Demand Mod Divide by Zero, specifically does that. And I know a lot of people dislike that mod because of it, but I do think it makes things more interesting because uh, if there's a chance that the rebels can win against you, then there's some actual tension and then the rebels become a force to be reckoned with and you have to actually put some effort into fighting them, and I think that's more interesting. So that's the second thing. Third, I don't really like the way they're dumped on the map, so I don't think that is a good representation of the way rebellions actually spread. I think there's a better way to model that. If we compare to Victorian 1, we have a per province revolt risk. So for each province, you can see at the bottom there is a percent chance for rebellion per month. And the individual rebel stacks that appear vary in their strength. Some will be very weak, some will be almost as strong as individual divisions. The more important thing is that if I've got high revolt risk, it's not just a one and done. Rebels are something that, at least in this game, I'm going to have to worry about for a good while. Victoria 1 doesn't have the fort spam of Victoria 2, so it's likely that if a rebellion happens in a province without a fort, that province might fall before you get to it. And if that happens, the rebellion can propagate, and really that makes a lot of sense to me. Unfortunately in Victoria 1 there doesn't appear to be any sort of automated rebel suppression, which means in Victoria 1 dealing with rebels is a huge pain. 
Now, in Victoria 3, assuming we do have automated rebel suppression, I don't think that should be any more difficult than it is in Victoria 2 using automated rebel suppression. The only difference would be the impact of the rebellions, but again, it should depend on the rebellions. Low-level rebellions should be easy to deal with. On the other hand, if you have an uprising in a province with a massive population, that shouldn't necessarily be easy to deal with, and maybe you need to pull in some more troops. There's also a possibility for an incorporation of something like the Hoi 4 system for suppressing rebels, which is to assign divisions to rebel suppression and then let them move to optimized positions to deal with rebellions. That's another possibility. There are multiple possible solutions, and uh, really I think any of them could be an improvement, but the important thing is that I think Rebellions should be more impactful, in some cases also more difficult to deal with. Also perhaps that there should be more of a distinction between low-level revolts and larger rebellions which should be more of a challenge to deal with. Number 13. Navies, as inspired by Toy 4. The naval system in Victoria 2 is very underdeveloped, so I'm again going to point to Hoi 4 as a starting point. I'm not an expert at the Hoi 4 naval system by any means, but there are some things that I think would be fantastic if ported to Victoria 2. First is the ability to take individual fleets and then assign them areas of operations. In addition, telling them what to do in those areas of operations. All of the different options that are listed here are, at least in some way, applicable to the Victoria timeline, and that includes mine laying and mine sweeping too. Second, in Victoria 2, as with the lack of variance in land based units, there's really hardly any variation here at all. You have cookie cutter ships that you spam out to whatever level you can. Not a great system, not particularly interesting. So again, I'm going to point to Hoi 4. Hoi 4 system of customizing ships using the research that you have gained over time is fantastic. And this system could give some real character to your different ships. These customizations should be possible going all the way back to the frigates and man wars that you start with. Things like mast and sail optimizations and customizing the amount and position of guns on these ships. These should have a direct impact and obviously the better the ship is the more expensive it's going to be. In Victoria 2 you just spam out ships endlessly. So let's make some actual distinctions between the heavy ships that you put tons of resources into and cost of fortune to maintain versus the smaller ships that can help you in things like coastal defense and raiding. And again, the Hoi 4 timeline essentially covers 10 years, but for Victoria 2, we've got 100 years of naval advancement to play with. There's no reason that it shouldn't be represented in different types of hulls, different classes of ships, and advances in armaments. 19th century naval history is fascinating, but none of it is really being represented in Victoria 2. Let's allow players to conduct unrestricted submarine warfare during World War I. How about allowing players to build smaller torpedo boats if they don't have the resources to build battleships? There are also different strategies for employing and utilizing your ships that aren't represented at all in Victoria 2. You probably remember from Victoria 2 the distinctions between blue water and brown water navy, but in Victoria 2 it's just a modifier that you don't want. How about in Victoria 3 we have an actual distinction between blue water and brown water navies, where close to shore and up major rivers the brown water navies dominate. And out on the open ocean, it's all about the blue water navies. But you should be able to specialize your navy based on what you're intending to do as a nation. So let's say it's the 1860s and it's the Civil War. And uh, you want naval supremacy. Are you going to build a blue water navy? No, of course not. You're going to build ironclads to take control of the river systems and the intercoastal waterway. On the other hand, if you're the UK, you don't really have a need for a brown water navy. The ships that you build and the way that you outfit and specialize them is going to be very different than the US at this stage of the game. There's also a possibility of the fleet in being, which is not represented at all in Victoria 2. And how could this be represented in Victoria 3? If you have a brown water sea zone adjacent to land that you control, you should have a massive defensive bonus for any ships that you have in that sea zone. This is why the Austrian Navy persisted throughout all of World War I, because basically no one could get to it with its strong defensive position. But why would you want to have a fleet in being? If you have a fleet in a fantastic defensive position, and it would be suicidal to attack it, Guess what you don't have to worry about? Naval invasions. So you should be able to have an effective navy just by keeping it near your coastline. So instead of having the one-size-fits-all navies of Victoria 2, let's allow for things like defensive navies and naval specialization. Finally, in Victoria 2 we have the naval force limit system which really doesn't need to exist. So in this case, as in the case of Hearts of Iron 4, we're using manpower, resources, and upkeep to determine how large your navy can be. 
And really, it's just a question of how much economic strain you're willing to put up with in order to maintain your navy. Now, of course, as you upgrade your ships over time, you might end up with some old hull designs that you no longer want, and there's no reason you shouldn't be able to transfer these to another nation in a trade deal. Number 14. Aeronautics, as inspired by Toy 4. Unfortunately, aeronautics is very poorly depicted in Victoria 2. Usually players don't even bother messing with airplanes, it's simply not worth it for the bonus that they provide. Airplanes in Victoria 2 are essentially replacement hussars, but they appear so late in the game that there's no real pressing need to ever use airplanes. And I think that's really unfortunate, especially when you consider all the interesting developments in aeronautics at the turn of the last century. And again, for an example, I'm going to be going to Hoi 4. In Hoi 4, air tech starts in the interwar era, but there's a ton of advancement that took place in the 30 years before this, and even going back further than that. But we have to consider the role of aeronautics during this era. As depicted in Victoria 2, the primary goal of early air forces was reconnaissance. And that should also be the case in Victoria 3. But in addition to that, the battle for local air superiority could be an interesting element to add on top of trench warfare during the Great War era. A quick Google search tells me that a Sopwith Camel's range was 217 miles. A Fokker D7 had a range of 165. The DR1 had a range of 186. So basically, we're not looking for fighters to go so far into enemy territory. For our fighters, we're looking at max ranges of between 150 to 300 miles. So these strategic bombers with this massive range, this just doesn't happen in the Victorian era. We're looking way more localized than this. Second, bombing targets tend to be things like infrastructure, rail bridges, depots, factories. Not to mention the huge psychological impact of close air support during a time when airplanes were still a novel thing. The more important thing is that you want to see the enemy's movement, so the most important thing of all is going to be reconnaissance. Now something that's not represented here that should be present in the Victorian era is balloons. During the Great War, balloons were one of the go-tos for observation, and of course you need fighters to go up and take down the balloons. And then of course you need other fighters to defend your balloons. Early in the Great War, before pilots started shooting at each other, airplanes were almost exclusively used for reconnaissance, going up and taking pictures of targets. If you go back before the Great War, you still had the use of observation balloons. Observation balloons were used for artillery spotting as far back as the U.S. Civil War. Before that, there were some other failed attempts to use them in various ways, but this technological progression could be a supplement and really gives some character to Victoria III. So imagine you're playing and it's 1860s through 1880s, and you're in a big battle, and you bring a balloon with you. Well, guess what? Your artillery is going to get a massive bonus, because for the first time in history, you're able to direct your artillery at targets that they can't even see. And then jump forward into the 1910s, and it's an arm race. People trying to shoot down your balloons, you're trying to defend your balloons. You're using reconnaissance planes and bombers. You've got Fokkers, Camels, Speds, Newports, Bristols, all just going at it. That would be fantastic in Victoria 3. Now there is an important transition that takes place because in the late 1800s, when we're talking about just balloons, these balloons moved with the military. These balloons should just be attached to units, and they should of course move relatively slowly as a consequence of that. It's not until we bring airplanes into the mix that we really need airfield. I'm not sure if we need quite the developed system that we have in Hoi 4. I mean, it wouldn't hurt, but it's also not completely necessary. Because really, any patch of grass or level field of dirt will work as long as it has a hangar on it. So if you want to represent that using the airfields like we have in Hoi 4, fine. If not, if you just want to put them on an individual province, I think that would be just fine as well. The more important thing is that I want to give some depth to what's going on in the air, whether it's strictly reconnaissance or whether it's fighting for dominance and bombing enemy targets. Number 15. Gold Standard, Silver Standard, and Central Banks. Players of Victoria are used to trading in a universal currency, the pound, but I don't think this is a very accurate representation of the situation in the 19th century. Now, I'm not an economist, but as I understand it, this was the era of the gold and silver standards. This was the era of the rise and fall and rise again of central banking. So I think this should be addressed in the game. This isn't a system that I've fully worked out, but as I'm imagining it, nations would trade on the world market using bullion. With the finite amount of bullion in the world increased by the amount of gold and silver being produced by mines, the transfer of that bullion between nations would determine the relative prices of the goods in those different countries. This also means that the purchasing power of your pops increases and decreases according to the amount of bullion either entering or leaving your nation. This could also allow the game to model some of the various economic crises and collapses that occurred during the 19th century. 
But this is just conceptual. I don't know how well this would work in the game, but I do think it would add some interesting flavor, so it's something to consider. So I do think the addition of gold and silver standards and central banking that is more than just an administrative efficiency buff would be an interesting addition to an economics heavy grind strategy game. Intermission. Before I continue, I highly recommend you check out Nurse Reno's excellent post on Reddit about the relationship between sphering and item and goods production and distribution. I say this because many people, myself included, were operating under a misconception of the way that trade worked within spheres. Even though it's a relatively odd system, it doesn't have a huge impact on the game versus what you probably think is happening within spheres. Now, in going forward, I'm going to assume you've read the post and that you understand what's going on under the hood in Victoria 2, and that you'll be able to see what the differences are in what I'm proposing for Victoria 3. So let's continue. Number 16. Trade Modifiers and Policies. As inspired by Toy 4. First off, this slider is a really terrible representation of economic policy. This one-size-fits-all system is not how reality works. So let's go to trade and actually split it up. So you should be able to take any particular good, for example fruit, and then apply taxes to it. Now just so everyone's got their definition straight, a tariff is a tax on something that's been imported. So in this case, the fruit comes in at a given price, 1.8, and if we have a 100% tariff on fruit, the pops in our nation have to pay 3.6 to get it, but 1.8 of that goes into our coffers. So that's how our tariff works. Now the other half of this slider that never gets used, this would be an import subsidy. So if our people are starving to death and they don't have enough money to buy the fruit, we could provide an import subsidy that decreases the effective cost of fruit. So it's coming into the nation at 1.8, we're then paying it down to a lower value, and then the pops buy it for less than 1.8. So that's an import subsidy. And I hope you can see why it doesn't make sense to apply one set of tariffs and one set of subsidies to every single good that you produce. And this is the first slider that we could apply tariffs and import subsidies for every single good that we're importing. But now let's talk about exports. In this case, we're China, we're producing a ton of tea. You can see the demand is almost double the supply. So if we've got all this excess tea that we're just shipping out into the world, how about we make some money off of it? This is called an export tax. So if we increase our export tax to 100%, it's going out at 2.6, but it reaches the global markets at 5.2. So 2.6 of that goes into our coffers, everywhere else in the world are having to bite at 5.2. The flip side of the export tax would be the export subsidy, which you would rarely want to use in general, but we'll get to specific circumstances later where you might want to use it. So in the case of the export subsidy, we're producing tea, it's going out at 2.6, and maybe we want to flood the market with cheap tea. So we're going to pump our own money into it to pay it down. So 2.6, let's say we drop that to 1.3, so the world starts buying our super cheap tea, 1.3 pounds. That's an export subsidy. Now that's for international trade, trade between nations. But we can also manipulate trade within our nation, and that's through something called an excise tax. An excise tax is something on a specific type of good. You can almost think of it like a sales tax. The common example is alcohol and gasoline. So if we had wine, and let's say this were an even 10, if we had wine in our nation, enough to supply the pops, if we had a 15% excise tax on it, then our 10 pounds would become 11.5 and 1.5 of that would go into our coffers. So the pops are paying more money for it, but the excess is going to us in tax. So this is an alternative to this generic tax system that we have. That is, we can take specific goods and apply a tax unique to that type of good. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's look at markets themselves. Now when it comes to trade policy, this is something that I think is underused in Victoria 2. In Victoria 2, practically all it does is impact where you can set your tariffs. All this does is annoy you if you happen to be a nation with free trade. But let's consider what this actually means. How much control should we as the ruler have on the trade between nations? And this relates to things like tariffs, export taxes, etc. But really it should also apply to the markets themselves. So again, I'm going to point to Hoi 4. And what I want to point to is right here, because in Hoi 4, What's represented here by trade law, this is what's represented by free trade versus protectionism in Victoria 2. This is what percentage of our productivity is being exported either with or without the government's control. Now in Hoi 4, this primarily impacts your war industry and also the export of raw materials. But the same can be applied to Victoria 3. 
So if you want absolute control over your markets, you should have the option to close your markets. Now this, of course, depends on your government and which nation you're playing and that sort of thing, but this should be an option in the game. On the other hand, if you want to make a lot of money off of export taxes, then of course export focus is the way to go. In any case, what I'm proposing is an expansion of the one-size-fits-all system that's present in Victoria 2. So instead of just hopping into the game and instantly setting your tariffs to the max value, let's make this a system that you can actually do something with. Number 17. Economic Policies Next, we have to address economic policies, for example, interventionism, laissez-faire, and state capitalism. In Victoria 2, this manifests as whether you as a player have any control over the factories and infrastructure in your nation. But I think we could have a system that goes a bit deeper than that. For example, you would expect in real life a laissez-faire economic policy should provide your capitalists with the best return on investment, but that's never what happens in Victoria 2. In Victoria 2, laissez-faire industries just collapse repeatedly until eventually they take hold and then proceed in spite of the fact that they're laissez-faire, not because they're laissez-faire. On the flip side, any economic policy that allows you to subsidize will allow you to fine-tune your industry and make it succeed whether or not it would have on its own. And not only that, but much more profitably as well. Now I don't think this is a great system in Victoria 2, and I think there should be actual incentives for players to want that laissez-faire economic policy. Now in Victoria 2, laissez-faire is terrible for a number of reasons, but the actual downside of a laissez-faire economic policy is that you, as the government, don't get to choose what's being produced. The flip side of that is that your economy should be booming because you're not getting involved. What I'm getting at here is that I think the different economic policies need better incentives to use them. And I think all of them should have different incentives. Unlike the system in Victoria 2 where one is hot garbage, one is meh, and the rest are pretty great. Number 18. Markets, convoys, embargoes, and blockades. As inspired by Stellaris and Toy 4. Now before we continue, I want to jump over to Stellaris. I think Stellaris does a really great job of representing the way the global market could work in Victoria 3. No one single good has one price. And this is true also in reality. If you look at individual stocks, that sort of thing, um, there are buy prices and there are sell prices. And these are not the same. What I like most about the Stellaris system is that it encourages players to not use the world market. Of course, people use it anyway, but really the optimum thing to do is to set up individual trades. And I think that should also be the case in Victoria 3. So for Victoria 3, I'm envisioning a world market which is very inefficient. You can sell into it, but you'd be losing value. You can buy from it, but you'd also be spending more than you need to. So the more efficient thing to do in this case would be to set up trade deals with other nations. As far as trade deals, I see this going a few different ways. Uh, first and most obviously is directly transferring your goods from one nation to another. That is, from your stockpile into the stockpile of another nation. That's pretty straightforward. But if we have the option to have tariffs, export taxes, etc., you should be able to have a free trade agreement with another nation. That is, we're just going to allow free trade between our two nations without any export or import taxes imposed. And finally, there should be trade agreements that deal with just a specific good. These sorts of treaties would also allow for things like the unequal treaties which affected China during the 19th century. So, for example, imposing unilateral trade deals where you benefit from export taxes but the importer cannot impose tariffs would be a possibility under this system. The general idea, though, is that you as a nation should have more control over the trade deals that you enter into with other nations. And of course, the exact nature and types of trade deals I think is subject to refinement. In addition, I think the spread between the high and low values for any individual good in the world market should probably be based on your nation's share of either the world production or the world stockpile of that particular good. So basically, the more of it that you control, the less value you would lose by trading through the world market. Two additional systems that I think are very underutilized in Victoria 2 are embargoes and blockades. And I think one way to address this would be to incorporate the Hoi 4 convoy system. In Hoi 4, whenever you have a trade deal with a nation, you have to actually transport your goods from one nation to another. Now, if you border that nation, that's pretty easy, but if you don't share a border, then that means you're going to need convoys. These convoys are vulnerable. In Victoria 2, we can build commerce raiders, but they don't actually raid commerce, which I think is a big problem. So I think that more refined embargoes and blockades are something that could be incorporated into Victoria 3, 
by expanding on both the trade and naval systems. Now the primary goal of a blockade is to prevent trade, right? Well, unfortunately in Victoria 2, the primary effect of a blockade is to just drive up war exhaustion very, very slowly. But what I'm looking at here is a system to actually impact the trade between nations. Now as far as embargoes, what I'd like to see is actually cutting off access to trade between nations and also to the world market. So let's jump back to paint for a moment. In Victoria 2, the world market is a monolith that all nations trade with essentially equally, but that's not quite the system that I'm looking at here for Victoria 3. What I'm looking at is something a bit different. Let's take an example here of a nation like Paraguay. Who is Paraguay realistically going to be able to trade with? Well, there's Brazil, there's Argentina, and there's Bolivia, and really that's it. Anything else is going in or out of Paraguay has to get through one of these three nations first, right? Which means that the world market, as far as Paraguay is concerned, is only three nations. Now this is a kind of extreme example for a landlocked nation, but I think this shows you what I'm getting at. How about for a nation like Venezuela? Well, they've got land connections to the UK, Brazil, and Colombia, and then if they want to trade with anyone else, they're going to need convoys to do that. So the ones they can easily trade with right off the bat are these three nations. Anyone else they want to trade with, they're either going to have to build convoys or the person they're trading with is going to need to build convoys. This is how we're going to restrict access to the world market. So the more powerful you are, the more convoys you have, the more nations you can trade with. The less powerful you are, and especially if you're landlocked, the fewer options you have. And that makes a lot of sense. It also means that your neighbors have a larger impact over the trade that you have access to. Take Kiva, for example. They can trade with Russia, Persia, and the other miners next to them. Well, who are they going to be getting most of their trade from? It's going to be Russia and Persia. And so Russia and Persia can exert influence on Kiva economically based on who is supplying them with what. It also means that if Russia decides to embargo Kiva, they're going to be in a world of hurt. These sorts of economic manipulations are what I would like to see in Victoria 3. So let's go back to paint. In Victoria 2, the world market is one monolith. And this is a system that I want to replace. So let's consider an order of operations for trade in Victoria 3. First off, we've got our national market. And this includes the uh, state market as well as the civilian market. I'm just going to include these together because the function of them is the same. And they can interact with each other, but really what we're looking at is how they interact with the outside world. So preferentially, it, the markets want to get the best value for any goods that they're selling, as well as buy things for as cheap as possible, right? Which means that preferentially, we're going to want to trade with nations that we have trade deals with. And we're going to refine this a bit more in a moment, but just conceptually. So remember, if we're losing value every time we trade with the so-called world market, then we want to preferentially trade with people that we have trade deals with. We'll refine this some more in just a moment. But what I want to point out here is that the world market should be our last resort. And I also want to point out here that the world market in this case refers to nations that we can trade with and not the actual world as a whole. Because it's unreasonable for a nation to trade with the entire world uniformly. It just doesn't make sense. But what this means is just because we can trade with a nation doesn't mean we necessarily want to because we can usually get a better deal if we have a trade deal with someone else. Now, when we're talking about trade deals up here, this includes trade deals that we have set up and also trade deals that are just part of the mechanics, for example, being part of a sphere. That's included here as well. But now we're going to separate this out a bit. When we're talking about order of operations, unfortunately, the one that's going to be at the top of the list is the one that's going to hurt the nation the most, which is the imposed trade deal. And this is, for example, something that's imposed in a war or something that's imposed with the threat of war. A good example would be an unequal treaty in China, which is... China definitely does not want to make this trade, but they're going to have to make the trade. And if they've agreed to it, or if they've been forced to make the deal, then this goes at the top of the list, even though it hurts the nation. The order of operations for every other possible deal is going to be determined by the market. So in this box, we're going to represent all trade deals that we have, and all the different nations that we have trade deals with. We're just going to make these... Uh, individual boxes. So how do we determine which of these nations is the one that we're going to be buying from preferentially? Well, we're going to do this using the cost of the goods. So how do we determine the actual cost of any good that's being imported? Number one, we start with the base cost as determined by the worldwide market. We multiply that by any export taxes because if goods are leaving these nations and if they're being taxed as they leave, that gets included here. And in some cases, this won't apply. For example, within spheres, you won't have export taxes. But if we've got a trade deal with a the nation, then yes, we can have an export tax. 
And next, if we're imposing any tariffs on incoming goods, those go here. Using the simple formula, we can determine what the actual cost per good is from any one of these nations. So again, in some cases, export taxes won't apply. In some cases, tariffs won't apply. But we've got a really good idea of what the individual cost is going to be from any one of these nations. And what we want to do as a nation is buy from those that are cheapest first. And then we order these from cheapest to most expensive. And then we buy in that order. If we can fulfill our needs using only the cheapest one, then we just use the cheapest one. If we've bought all the excess from the cheapest one, we move to the next cheapest one, and then we start buying from that one. So in this way, you can have some competition between nations, because those with the lowest export taxes are going to be preferentially bought from over those with the higher export taxes. But again, this is order of operations. Now, if we're going down this branch here, we've already satisfied our trades with anyone we have trade deals with, but we still need more goods, right? So now we're down here at the world market, and we now have to buy from the world market. Well, the same considerations apply. So we've got a number of nations that we can trade with. And we can order these from most favorable to least favorable using the same equation right here. And then once we figured out which ones are the most favorable trades, those are the trades that we're going to make. The only difference is that in addition to the actual cost here, we're going to have an additional cost thanks to the fact that we're trading with a nation we don't have a trade deal with. Now, this could also allow us to do some additional fun economic manipulations. We can buy and sell to a given stockpile value. Well, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to have simultaneous buy and sell orders. So imagine this. Let's say you're playing Brazil and you want to become the South American coal monopoly. Now, Brazil doesn't produce any coal of its own, but let's say Brazil enters into a trade deal with the UK, or maybe even France. So, Brazil gets cheap coal, and in return, UK and or France are getting tropical wood, tea, coffee, etc. So trade can run in both directions, of course, but for this, I'm only considering the coal. They're getting cheap coal from overseas. They don't need any convoys because they share a border. And now Brazil's got a lot of coal. Well, what are they going to do with this coal? Let's say Brazil sets a buy order for 1,000 units of coal, which means they're going to buy up to the stockpile of 1,000 coal. Some of that's going to be used by their own pops, and then they're going to have a lot more left over. Well, what can they do then? They can set a sell order for 500 coal, which means that any excess they have over 500 can then be bought by other nations. Well, Brazil can now sell its coal to all these bordering nations, some of which have no choice but to buy from Brazil. Convoys cost money, which means a lot of these poor nations are not going to have the option of importing from overseas. So Brazil is going to be the go-to trade partner, which means Brazil has the option to corner the coal market in South America. That's just one particular good and one example, but this is the sort of thing that I see playing out in Victoria 3, where goods can be traded back and forth and individual trade deals determine where those goods flow, rather than a completely generic world market as is the case in Victoria 2. This also means that embargoes can be devastating and a major part of international diplomacy. Before we continue, I do want to mention that this system would require some additional balancing. I just want to make the point that the world market is not the entire world, and even if you are considering the entire world, some nations should be cheaper and easier to trade with than others. For example, those that you border go at the top of the list because they don't necessarily need convoys, and those that are further away and harder to trade with, those go at the bottom because it's going to be more expensive to trade with them. And that should be factored in here when we're determining how much it's actually going to cost to get something from a nation you don't have a trade deal with. Number 19. Diplomacy as inspired by Victoria 1 and EU 4. Unfortunately, diplomacy in Victoria 2 leaves a lot to be desired. Almost half of all diplomatic actions have to do with sphere management. So if you aren't a great power, you don't even have access to these. So what can we do? We can form alliances, we can call allies to war, give and ask for military access, increase or decrease relations, provide war subsidies, declare war, justify war, and command units if we have a puppet. There's so much that's missing here, and let's just come up with a quick list of things that should be here. And let's just hop over to Victoria 1 first. First thing we notice is that we've got way more options just for alliances, which really this should be the case in a Victoria game. We can have alliances that are offensive and defensive, or we can have strictly defensive alliances. We can also set exceptions. For example, we might have a defensive alliance, but I'm not going to fight my ally Prussia, so we'll set that as an exception. Now there are some limitations in Victoria 1, but realistically this sort of thing should be possible, where we'll say, we'll defend each other but only in certain cases, or we'll have an offensive alliance but only in certain cases. This should be in Victoria 2, it should also be in Victoria 3. We also have the option to send expeditionary forces, which is essentially the same as Condottieri in uh, EU4. 
There's a distinction between military and naval access, which makes sense. We can demand the cessation of colonization in certain areas, which again makes sense. Now let's take a look at negotiations. You notice you can trade land, you can trade money. And also in Victoria 1, if you didn't know, you can trade tech, although you have to technically research it yourself, but we'll ignore that for now. There are things that you can do in Victoria 1 that should realistically be in Victoria 2. You'll notice that most multiplayer mods in Victoria 2 account for and add the things that are missing from Victoria 1. For example, the ability to give land from one nation to another, or just the ability to transfer money. This is massively important and it's missing from Victoria 2. There's no reason this should not be in Victoria 3. While we're talking about negotiations, this is also where trade deals should be located in Victoria 3. Whether that's a free trade agreement, whether that's trade of a specific good, or whether that's just transferring some amount of a resource, or even weapons, that sort of thing. That should all be listed right here. There are also some diplomatic actions in EU4 that should be ported to Vic 3. For example, sending a warning or threatening war. And you should be able to threaten war for any number of things, not just a single province as you can in EU4. Again, perfect example, unequal treaty with China. Threaten war, if they accept, you get the treaty. If they decline, you go to war, now you get to fight for it. How about some covert actions in Victoria 3? Supporting rebels, sabotage, etc. How about instead of just giving war subsidies like you can in Victoria 2, we can give actual subsidies with an amount that we can set. That would be great. Low interest loans to your allies, again, something that would make sense. Of course, embargoes I've already talked about. Selling ships, again, you should be able to transfer your old equipment to your allies and other nations if you like. Taking on foreign debt, this seems like a no-brainer. What I'm getting at is that Victoria 3 should have more diplomatic options, not less. Number 20. Diplomatic Uncertainty. As inspired by EU3 and Victoria 1. If you've watched my videos comparing EU3 and 4, then you already know my position on certainty versus uncertainty. But I'm just going to reiterate it here because this is the Victoria 3 that I'm designing. In Victoria 2 and in just about every modern Paradox game, diplomatic actions have binary results. The result is yes or no and it's determined entirely based on point values that you can see and manipulate. I hate this system and I would absolutely get rid of it. For a game that does it right, let's go back to Victoria 1. Alright, so we've got Victoria 1 loaded up. Let's say for whatever reason we're playing UK and we want to sell Malta to France. We've selected Malta, here labeled as Valletta. And I'm asking for 2,700 pounds. There's a 100% chance this AI is going to accept. Let's ask for a bit more money. Oh, the chance has gone down. You see that the more money we're asking for, the lower the chance. But it's not a 100% to zero. There's something in between. You'll notice we have to increase the price to 5,500 pounds before it drops to 0%. That's a range of almost 3,000 pounds between zero and 100% chance. Which means anytime we're negotiating, we can always sweeten the deal to make things go in our favor. To me, this makes things way more interesting than the binary diplomacy of Victoria 2, of EU4, and Stellaris. Now, in the case of Victoria 1, we've got the chance of a diplomatic action going through represented as an actual percentage. But if we want to abstract this some more, we can. My favorite system for diplomatic uncertainty is in EU3. Because in EU3, nothing is guaranteed. If we go to Royal Mary Scotland, it's very likely, but you notice this doesn't say 100%. This could be 99, this could be 95, this could be 90, but there's always some chance of failure. And the flip side is also true. If we want to Royal Mary France, it's very unlikely, but this doesn't say 0%, so we don't actually know what this is. We can try, it's possible it might go through anyway, but it's not a guaranteed zero the way it would be in most other Paradox games. And it certainly isn't a binary yes or no the way it is in the later Paradox games. Please give us some level of uncertainty when dealing with AIs. Number 21. Sphere Automation. I don't have a huge problem with the way that spheres of influence work in Victoria 2. Perhaps my one complaint is that if you go from 8th to 9th you lose your entire sphere and that just seems incredibly cheap. So maybe, maybe the size of a sphere should be determined by your place in the rankings. Um, but that's a minor thing. The more important thing here is that I think you should be able to automate your sphere. And given that the AI can manage its own sphere, I don't see any reason that you shouldn't just be able to tick a box and let the AI handle this for you. This would be especially important for less experienced players who don't understand how spheres work. The way I envision it, sphere automation would do two things, exactly the same as the AI does. Number one, defending your sphere. This is the top priority. Your sphere AI should be able to detect when your sphere is being encroached upon and then discredit, ban, or expel as needed in order to keep their influence down. 
In addition, you should be able to set targets and priorities for sphere expansion, so rather than having to micromanage diplomacy yourself, of course you should be able to micromanage it if you want to, but you should also be able to say, if I'm playing the Ottomans and my neighbor Persia looks like a really good target for sphere expansion, I should be able to set Persia as a sphere target, and then the AI should be able to go in and start sphering it for me. And if I don't have any sphere targets, and I've already fully defended my own sphere, then the AI should be able to identify some targets for me and start expanding. And again, this is especially important for new players who don't really understand how spheres work. Can you imagine a new player on Prussia or Austria or especially the UK trying to deal with its sphere? It's hard enough for experienced players, much less a new player. Let's allow for some level of automation to reduce this level of headache. On the flip side, you as a player should also be able to exclude targets from sphere automation. For example, the Ottoman Empire might choose not to sphere Egypt or Najd for very obvious diplomatic reasons. Number 22. Infamy and Coalitions. As inspired by EU4 and Victoria 1. For everyone who's been waiting for something major to disagree with me on, this point is for you. As I said in my comparison of EU3 and 4, blobbing should never be safe. And although blobbing is a lot more difficult in Victoria 2, the fact that it's safe at all is a problem as far as I'm concerned, which means this number should not be displayed to the player, because the player shouldn't be aware down to the decimal point how close they are to triggering a coalition. There are some additional problems with this, but for my Victoria 3, we're going back to the Victoria 1 system, which is you don't know exactly how close you are to reaching your limit, but once you reach it, you will know. So while we're at it, let's make some changes to the infamy system as a whole. As I mentioned elsewhere, there's one thing that EU4 does exceptionally well, and that's the concept of aggressive expansion. If you invade and take land from a nation, other nations in the world are not going to be equally pissed off at you. Those nations that have the highest relations with the one you just attacked are going to be the ones that are most upset with you. And those nations that are closer to the one you just attacked are also going to be more upset with you. So let's incorporate that concept into Victoria 3 which means you're not going to be facing a massive worldwide coalition the second you go 0.01 infamy over the cap the way you would in Victoria 2 or even in EU3. So let's consider what a peace deal might look like from the perspective of an attacker. And I'm not going to pull up EU4 for this, but you can use your imagination. Let's say Sardinia, Piedmont, and Austria are at war with each other. And Austria has lost the war, and Sardinia, Piedmont is selecting which states to take from Austria. If this were EU4, in the peace deal window, you would see a depiction of which nations might join a coalition against you. And that's a major problem in EU4 as far as I'm concerned. But we can replace that with a more ambiguous system. But let's say in this EU4 example, there are five nations that would join against you. Austria obviously being one of them, and then nations that really have a high favorable opinion of Austria, like Two Sicilies, Prussia, etc. Now in a Victoria 3 example, you select these same states, and it would tell you in the peace deal window there are five nations that will join a coalition against you, but it doesn't tell you which ones, and it also doesn't tell you how pissed they are at you. So now there's some uncertainty. If you take these states, you know that people will be pissed off, but you don't know how much, and you also can't micromanage which nations can and can't join a coalition against you, which is the important thing. You add state number six to the peace deal, and then you look, oh, okay, well now eight nations are going to join against you. Again, you don't know which eight nations, and you don't know how pissed they're going to be. So do you want to take that risk? Do you want to jump from five nations in a potential coalition to eight? Is it worth it? Especially if you don't know which nations they are. Now how about instead of taking the peace deal that you plan to take initially, you only take four states. You say, oh, okay, well there's only two nations that are going to join a coalition. So that's something that you can deal with, and you're willing to take that risk but it's not the guaranteed outcome that you have in EU4. So let's walk through this process in the way that a coalition might actually work. Sardinia Piedmont takes these states right here, and it does so knowing that it could potentially get a coalition of up to five nations. Unlike EU4, in which you can only join a coalition when you don't have a truce, you should be able to join a coalition instantly because truce breaking is a thing in Victoria 2. So let's consider the situation. Austria starts a coalition against Sardinia Piedmont. Its sphere members and allies decide to join the coalition. Let's uh, add some Italian ones here as well, even though this isn't exactly five. And then uh, let's say Two Sicilies also joins. So at this point, we have a coalition against Sardinia Piedmont. But unlike EU4, this is going to be specifically a defensive coalition for right now. Remember how in Victoria 1 Diplomacy, we had the option to choose between a defensive alliance and a defensive and offensive alliance? Well, coalition should be the same. So by default, if you join a coalition, it's a defense-only coalition. But if you hate someone enough and you're willing to go all the way, you should be able to tick that box and change your coalition status from defensive to offensive. 
So what does this mean? Well, unlike EU4, in which you can join a coalition, declare war, and then instantly everyone in the coalition has joined you, it means that nations can choose whether or not they want to go on the offensive against whatever nation they're in a coalition against. It also means that you don't have to be in an offensive coalition unless you've reached critical mass and can actually win the war. Let's say that Sardinia Piedmont decides to continue to be a warmonger, and now they go after France. They take this area right here, however many states that is knowing full well they're going to get additional nations in this coalition. So all these additional nations join the coalition, and in doing so, there's now a critical mass of nations, where before Austria and its allies, maybe they didn't want to go in an offensive war after Sardinia and Piedmont, but now they've got all these nations, plus all these nations together in a defensive alliance against Sardinia and Piedmont. So one by one they tick that box, and this defensive coalition transitions into an offensive coalition. But they only do so when they have the means to actually take on Sardinia and Piedmont. This prevents the suicidal coalition situation that you often see in EU4. To reiterate, you should be able to join a coalition against a nation and be defense only if you want, all the way through. You never have to change from defensive to offensive. But, especially in the case of AI, if enough of them join the coalition, they should see, okay, we've got critical mass, now let's change to offensive and we can actually do something about this threat. And finally, since we're not going to see the infamy counts for individual nations, how do you know when you can join a coalition? Well, right up here in the diplomatic notifications, this is where it should appear. If Sardinia Piedmont takes this area from Austria, Austria plus all the nations that Sardinia Piedmont has enough aggressive expansion with should get a notification right here that says you may now join a coalition against one or more nations. You click it, you can join the coalition if you want to. There should be no limit to the number of nations that you can join a coalition against. So unlike EU4, you shouldn't be restricted to a single coalition. Because as with EU4, there's often multiple threats that you have to deal with as a nation. But importantly, you don't know what the aggressive expansion level is. All you know is that this is now an available option to you. You don't have to take it, but you can if you want. Number 23. Bilateral Peace Deals. As inspired by Victoria 1. As we saw, the ability to negotiate deals was a key part of Victoria 1. There's no reason this shouldn't also be possible in conducting peace negotiations in Victoria 3. In virtually all Paradox games, wars have three possible outcomes. Either you win and you press your claims, you lose, you have claims pressed against you, or there's a white piece. The one exception to that I can think of off the top of my head would be Stellaris, in which case a white piece can result in territorial gains and losses for both sides. But this is the exception. What I would like to see is Victoria 1 style negotiations as possible peace negotiations to conclude wars. Peace deals shouldn't have to be unilateral, because that's not the way things work in real life, and certainly not the way things worked in the Victorian era. You should be able to win and lose in the same war. Of course, depending on what your war goals are. And your war goals don't have to necessarily be land. Of course, there's money, there's trade deals, there's reparations, there are all these possibilities, and none of it's being represented in Victoria 2. Let's represent that in Victoria 3. And in a game where diplomacy isn't binary yes-no outcomes, it means that these are ways that you can sweeten a peace deal to make the enemy accept it. And by doing so, you also lend legitimacy to the peace deal, just like it worked out in real life. Please, let's see this in Victoria 3. Number 24. Splitting States. As inspired by Victoria 1. The notion of states being inseparable is something that's unique to Victoria 2, and I think the Hoi games in general. I don't think this is a good representation of reality, and I don't think it's beneficial to gameplay either, especially when it comes to making deals with other nations and players. So I would like to go back to the Victoria 1 system in which, yes, provinces are part of states, but they can also be separated from those states and treated independently. I think this would be a better representation of reality. It would also allow for more interesting diplomacy, especially in multiplayer games. Number 25. Diplomatic Relations. As inspired by EU4. Managing diplomatic relations is a bit of a pain in Victoria 2 because everything relies on your diplomatic points. I think this is something where we can take a page out of the EU4 playbook because it handles things much better. In Victoria 2 multiplayer, oftentimes people forget to even go in and increase relations, and when they do, they do it all at once, then they forget about it again because no one's looking at these diplomatic points. But let's hop over to EU4 to see what an alternative could be. For Victoria 3, I'm imagining a system very much like the Diplomat system in EU4, taking whatever nation you like and improving relations in a passive manner. Even more useful than that, though, would be the ability to automate relations management. 
If this were Victoria 3, one very important box here would be for Sphere members, but I think you get the idea. In Victoria 2, it's the market functionality line within Commerce that gives you diplomatic influence increase. And I don't think this really makes sense, but since we have a finite number of diplomats, the number of diplomats that we get should probably be impacted by tech in some way. Number 26. Ministers and Cabinet. As inspired by Toy 4 and Pop Demand Mod for Victoria 2. Pop Demand Mod for Victoria 2 has a feature called First Ministers. Each nation is appointed one minister at random from among a pool of different types of ministers. You'll see in this case I got an expert diplomat, which gives me an infamy reduction and diplomatic point increase, but there are many different types focusing on different things. The EU4 equivalent would be the character traits for your leaders, but at least in Victoria 2 this is linked to your government. The Hoi 4 equivalent of this would be the various political advisors, with the important difference that in Hoi 4 you get to pick what type of advisor you want. This is not quite what I'm proposing. What I'm proposing is a system where every nation has a cabinet, and the first cabinet position is open by default. That's your first minister. After that, additional cabinet seats can be opened by focusing on technology. Different types of technology would open different types of seats. For example, if you focus on diplomacy, you open a minister of state. If you focus on navy, you unlock a minister of navy. Once you unlock a position, a minister is randomly generated and assigned for you. Most have bonuses of different sorts, some of them are placeholders, and some of them might even give you a malice. Ministers in general will have different bonuses, but since you don't get to select the minister, the bonuses that you get will be randomly assigned to you. This would provide additional variation between nations, and even between the same nation on different playthroughs. Number 27. National focuses, as inspired by EU3. Unfortunately, I think the national focus system leaves a lot to be desired, and I want to reconceptualize what a national focus could be. To begin with, I think a national focus should be a true focus, as in the case of EU3. In EU3, the national focus gives bonuses to the province set as the focus, plus all adjacent provinces. This could very easily be applied to a single state in a Victoria game. So, for example, in Victoria, if we were to set this state as our national focus, it would give a bonus to different modifiers within the state. This means that smaller states would benefit more from the national focus. This is the first change that I would make to the national focus system, by allowing one and only one national focus per nation. With that said, all of the other features of the national focus would be split off into other types of focuses. For example, in addition to the national focus, each nation should be allowed to have a migration focus. This would be the province or state that is preferentially chosen for immigration or migration within the nation. There are many different reasons you might want to set a particular province or area as your migration focus, whether that's to build up an industrial center, or to change the demographics of an area, or to boost the population in an area that you want to convert from a colony to a state. But really, this should be up to you. As in the case of Victoria 2, this migration focus would operate by percent chance, and thereby slightly skew the migration patterns within your country. But of course, over time that's going to add up, and that's the point of setting a focus. Next we have the increased tension national focus, which realistically, this should be a feature of diplomacy. That is, you go into diplomacy, you pick a nation, you assign a diplomat, and off they go to increase tension. Now for all the other national focuses, there is no real reason that a nation should be limited in the number of states that it can apply them to. Party loyalty, for example, this should be a national effect. If you're going to increase loyalty, it doesn't make sense to do it in just one state, so realistically, this should probably be something that your ministers are doing. It doesn't make sense to me to apply this as a national focus, and certainly not something where there's a finite number of focuses the way there are in Victoria 2. Let's consider next the railroads and production focuses. If your capitalists can build railroads, they're going to build railroads regardless of anything else, so this focus is completely meaningless. That leaves the various production focuses, and as you're probably aware from Victoria 2, these production focuses are practically useless. If you can build factories, then you don't need them, and if you can't build factories, then the AI is probably not going to do what you want it to do anyway. The best case scenario is that you're just going to keep closing factories over and over until they eventually build what you want. And then if you're lucky, they stay open. So what's the real problem here? Well, in my opinion, the problem is that the encouragement is just for building the factory. It's not for sustaining the factory. And really, that's what you need. If you want to encourage industry, and if you want to make that industry more profitable, then what you need instead of encouragement to build the factory is a bonus to throughput and production. So what I'm proposing is that every single state in the game 
gets a production focus. And that production focus gives modifiers that increases the throughput of a certain class of factories. This will in turn encourage the capitalists to build those types of factories to get the most benefit from the throughput bonuses. And of course, if a factory is not profitable, then the AI is just not going to build it. But with a throughput bonus, you can make something more profitable than it would have been otherwise. Finally, we have pop type encouragement. If you've watched Zero to Hero, then you know there's a general order of operations when it comes to promoting your pops. I don't think this is a good system in Victoria 2, and really, I don't want to see it ported to Victoria 3. Personally, I think this would be better handled through promotion via the budget sliders, but if we're going to insist on including this system of promoting pops in Victoria 3, then just like the production focuses, I think every single state should have a promotion focus. You can imagine a situation with two sets of boxes here. On the left, promotion focuses, and on the right, production focuses. And that's a lot to deal with, right? That's two per state, all the way down. And you're expected to micromanage this yourself, right? Well, not exactly, because I think this is another feature that easily lends itself to automation. You could tick a checkbox, and then all this gets handled for you. Your production focuses get set based on which ones are most profitable for that particular state. And then your promotion focuses get set according to things like how much spare room you have in your factories, what your literacy rate is, your government type, and if you have enough capitalists, that sort of thing. Here at the top, two extra boxes that override everything else. So for example, if you go to war, you want to encourage soldiers in every single state, bam, click a button, set them all to soldiers with two clicks. As far as automation, I do think it would be useful to have some specific presets that would encourage different types of things in different proportions, but really that's something that can be hashed out later. The key here is that the less time you spend staring at and managing your national focuses, the better. And this is especially true if you're looking at them here in the outliner in Victoria 2. So how about we replace that system with one that's mostly automated, except for your one national focus that you set in whichever state you want to have your bonuses, and your migration focuses, which is where a higher proportion of your population is going to be migrating to. Number 28. Technology System. As inspired by EU3. Toy 4, Victoria 1, Stellaris, and Path of Exile. Before we continue, I'm going to say that I don't particularly like the technology system in Victoria 2. Several reasons for this. First off, I don't like the rigidity of the tech meta that's evolved. What I mean by this is once you've learned the game, once you know what you're doing, there are certain techs that you always get in a particular order, which means there's hardly any variation in technology between nations. Second is that the vast majority of techs don't have a very large impact on the game. We're talking about things like percent increases to things that already exist. Of course, there are exceptions because some technologies actually unlock things, but the vast majority of techs just give you bonuses to things that you already have. And they feel kind of hollow. This is also true of inventions. The vast majority of inventions just give you additional modifiers to things that you already have. And some of those modifiers are good, don't get me wrong, but they're not particularly interesting when it comes to gameplay. And finally, this relates to most westernized nations being more or less on par with each other in tech. Virtually all technologies will be unlocked by every player nation by the end of the game. At least the important ones, you know, some of the commerce techs might be left out, but... The vast majority of nations are going to have all the way down to tier 6 tech in all of the important categories by the end of the game. Which means that technology itself provides essentially zero variance between playthroughs. And I don't think that's a very good system. Let's take a look at Victoria 1 for a second, just for comparison. If we go into the technology tab in Victoria 1, a few things I have to point out. First off, each of the five categories from Victoria 2 is represented here. And you'll notice if we click on any one of these, each of these columns has six entries. Basically, we have all the same texts that were represented in Victoria 2. We have six tiers in Victoria 2. We have six tiers in Victoria 1, essentially the same thing. The difference is that you don't get to pick which column you're going to research in. So for example, Army Professionalism. If we go to Army, we see that this is in the fifth column. For Naval Techs, we can research Naval Professionalism, which is again, all the way over to the right in the fifth column. For commerce texts, we've got stock exchange, which happens to be in the first column. Associationism and culture, this is in the fifth column. Practical steam engine, this is in the first column of industry. So we can pick any of the five texts, one from each of the five research branches, 
but we can't pick exactly which column we want necessarily. So we get to pick among the options that are presented to us. Now after choosing a tech and researching it, the next tech that will be presented will be different from the one that was presented before. Eventually as the techs circle around, you'll be able to research virtually all of the techs in Victoria 1 just as you can in Victoria 2. But the key difference between Victoria 1 and 2 is that you can't beeline techs the way you can in Victoria 2. For example, in Victoria 2, if you wanted to, you could research Experimental Railroad, and then Early Railroad, and then Iron Railroad, and Steel Railroad, all the way down, in order. You can't really do that in Victoria 1 because it's not going to present you these options in order. You'll get Experimental Railroad, and then five techs later you'll be presented with Early Railroad. And if you don't take it, it's going to be another five techs before it shows up again. Now that's not to say that there isn't a meta for tech progression in Victoria 1, but it does mean that it's nowhere near as streamlined and flavorless as it is in Victoria 2. Now let's go to a completely different example. I'm going to contrast this with Stellaris, which has one of my favorite research systems of any Paradox game. In Stellaris, your currently available research is based on the prerequisites that you've already met. So you might think of it this way. You've got your prerequisites, and all of the research that we can possibly get, we're going to put these on like playing cards, okay? So we've got a deck of cards. These are all the possible texts that we could research next. Out of this deck of cards, we're going to draw three cards, and then we get to pick one of those cards. So there might be like 15 cards. Three of those get presented to us at random, and then we pick one. The one really nice thing about the system is that no two playthroughs are going to be the same. The downside is that because there's a finite number of texts, eventually you will research all the texts the same way you would in a game like Victoria 2. So it's not a perfect system, but I like the concept of the system. Now let's take a look at EU3. The great thing about technology in EU3 is that there are trade-offs, meaning that the more you invest in any particular technology, the less you're going to be getting in all of the rest. And of course, all of these texts are going to be ticking up slowly on their own, but the one that you focus on is going to be increasing way faster. So again, you get to choose which one you want to focus on. They're all going to be ticking up slowly, but there's going to be a trade-off. So if you want to focus on one, the rest are going to be going up slower. And this is also a bit of additional nuance that I would like to see in Victoria 3. So before we continue, let's consider again what we have in Victoria 2. We've got technologies and we've got inventions. The first thing I'm proposing is that we take technologies and inventions and combine them together into one system called technology. There's no reason that these should be separate when all they're doing is giving small bonuses in addition to the technologies. Second, I'm going to propose getting rid of all the research point bonuses from culture ticks. A couple of obvious reasons for this. Number one, it doesn't make sense that philosophy should make you better at researching army or navy techs. And number two, the rapid increase in research is what allows nations to research every single tech in the game. So I want to try and move away from that. I want to have nations specialize in Victoria 3 and not research every single tech in the game. So what are you going to be getting research points from? Well, obviously literacy would be number one. But that's a minor issue. Typically in Victoria 2, there's the meta that you're going to be uh, researching techs, which is... The research and education culture texts are first, and then after that you might be focusing on any number of texts, for example medicine, you might focus on the various military texts, you might start your naval tech, you might focus on, uh, for example, a tax increase for commerce. But really, this is the critical one, and typically you're going to be maxing out your culture as quickly as possible. So at approximately 20 year intervals, you're going to be researching those critical culture texts, and typically this is the first tech that you're going to be maxing out. And then after that, you're going to be filling in those that are critical for various reasons. Which means Army is going to be one of the first two techs maxed out, followed by those critical industry techs, maybe Navy if you're really focusing on Navy, and then usually Commerce is last. But this is not a great system in my opinion, and this is one that I would like to move away from. Now, in conceptualizing a replacement, the first thing I thought about was something like a spider graph. And, but the idea with this sort of system would be that if you want to really focus on one thing, for example army, it would cause you to not do as well in the other categories. So that's like if we have a finite number of research points and we want to dump the majority of them into one thing, we're not going to do as well anywhere else. Or if you choose, you could be like a jack of all trades nation, right? So you could be moderate at everything but not particularly an expert in any one thing. No, I don't think this quite gets the point across either. So again, just conceptually. The next thing I thought about was a sort of opposing technologies system. An obvious example would be Army Tech versus Navy Tech. So the idea is, 
if you want to really focus on your army tech, then it's going to hurt your navy tech progression. Or, if you want to really focus on your navy tech, it's going to hurt your army tech progression. Or, if you want to be a jack-of-all-trades nation, you can be moderately okay in both of them. This is the sort of variance that I would like to see in Victoria 3. But again, this doesn't resolve all of the different possibilities for technology. I was trying to figure out a way to conceptualize this, putting it all together, and really what I came up with was something more akin to the passive skill tree from Path of Exile, as odd as this might sound. Now, I'm not talking about using something exactly like the skill tree, and certainly not something where players are going to allot skill points and that sort of thing, but let me just explain very briefly how this works. Now, in Path of Exile as a player, you start at a particular node, and then by investing your points, you unlock whatever attributes are unique to that node. So, for example, investing in this node might give you plus 1% health. But the idea is that from each node, you can then gain access to additional nodes. And a lot of them are branch points that lead into these clusters. Now, typically, these clusters have uh, some unique characteristics, some uh, unique attributes. And oftentimes, after you've completed a cluster, you'll get some larger bonus. So, for example, the smaller nodes within a cluster might give you plus 1% attack speed. And then once you finish the node, you get plus 5% attack speed. That's, again, just an example. So what I see when I look at this, if I'm looking at this in terms of Victoria 2, is these smaller nodes are the inventions. And these larger nodes and the bonuses for the clusters, these are the technologies. The idea being that as you unlock the prerequisites, that is the other technologies in the tree, you then gain access to both the inventions and the additional technologies. Again, the, the exact structure doesn't matter here. The more important thing is the relationship between what would be the inventions and the technologies. So let's look at this conceptually in the case of Victoria 2. So here's our starting point. So within Army Techs, we have five different columns, five different technologies available to us. And for each of those technologies, we have one or more inventions, right? Some of them don't have four, some have one, some have zero. It really doesn't matter. The key is we've got this branching structure. So you unlock the tech, and then you get access to those branch points that go off of it. And in the case of actual Victoria 2, the next thing would be an additional tech. So for the first column, we go from the first tech to the second tech, and so on. And in Victoria 2, of course, these unlock at different year intervals, but each of these techs has additional inventions that might uh, branch off of it. And, you know, some of them have one, some of them have two, some of have zero. What I'm looking at is a system like this. And again, the point here is to merge the inventions and the techs together. Because in Victoria 2, all you do is research the tech, and then all these smaller branch points, the inventions are automatic, right? For comparison, what I've drawn here is a representation of the current Victoria 2 tech system. In each of our five categories, we have five different columns, and each of those columns has six techs, represented here by the six different nodes. And off of each of those nodes, there might be one or more different inventions. So this is the current system, right? And it looks pretty linear as we're going out. Something that I didn't represent is that as we go down the tech tree in Victoria 2, the number of inventions per tech is not uniform. For example, here we've got, what is this, eight different inventions for medicine. Inorganic chemistry has five, organic has four, electricity has six, and so on. And now we get to the point where I'm actually going to propose a technology system for Victoria 3. And this system is going to be a hybrid of the Victoria 2 system, the Stellaris system, and the EU3 system. And furthermore, simplified and randomized so no two playthroughs are going to be the same. Here's how my tech system would work. So just like in Stellaris, we're going to be drawing cards. And for each of our five broad categories, we're going to have a number of cards representing different things. Now remember when I said technology and inventions get rolled into one system called technology, right? So our cards will represent all of the different technologies that are available to us, and that includes possible inventions. You'll notice at this stage of the game, 1836 and Victoria 2, we have no possible inventions. But basically, um, in our army category, we would have five cards, these five right here. In navy, we would have these five. In commerce, we would have these five. In culture, we would have these four, because these are the only four currently available. And in industry, we would have these five. So basically, we would have a choice of any of these five cards for uh, four of these categories, and then in culture, we would have four, okay? The difference between this technology system and every other tech system that Paradox has ever made is that you're not going to be picking the technology. So you're going to have a possibility of technologies, and then the game is going to basically randomly pick one for you. 
that's going to be the one that gets researched. So again, we have five cards in industry. Let's go ahead and draw five for army, five for navy, uh, five for commerce, and I believe we had four for culture. So representing each of the five columns. Now, unlike Stellaris, the game is going to pick which of these texts you're going to research. So basically, it's just going to pick one at random, and that's going to be the one that gets researched. Whichever column it happens to be, um, that's what it's going to be working on. And all of these are going to be researched simultaneously. So here in the case of industry, let's say we're researching the third column. So let's go take a look at that. We've got industry. Clean coal is what we're researching. Again, the AI picked this for us at random. After we're finished researching this, guess what? We've unlocked two inventions and one additional card, which is also activated in 1836. So at this point, we have researched this card, and we now have three additional cards. We have the middle column card, which was our technology, and we have two inventions. So now we have seven cards to draw from, which means that as you unlock technologies, again randomly because the AI will be selecting these for you, there's going to be a greater proportion of time devoted to unlocking the inventions that go with those technologies. You could assume that if we unlock this one, that's going to lead to one additional technology and maybe two or three additional uh, inventions that go along with it. So you can see in this way, we're unlocking access to additional inventions as we go through the technologies, which means our technological progression is going to slow down unless we get through those inventions. So now we pull in the EU3 influence. Remember in EU3 we had our different types of tech, and you could choose how much or how little to invest in each of those different types of tech. But even as you were focusing on one tech, all of the other techs were also being researched. This is another big change from the way things work in Victoria 2. So as with EU3, you'll passively be unlocking technologies and their corresponding inventions in all five categories. And just like EU3, you'll be able to select which of these five categories you're going to want to focus on. So for example, if you want to focus on culture, you'll be unlocking these techs and the corresponding inventions faster, but you're still going to be unlocking all the other techs and inventions at the same time. So what are some of the major differences between this system and Victoria 2, and why do I think this is a better system? Well, first off, unlike Victoria 2, this system prevents the sort of metagaming where you rush certain techs in a precise order every single playthrough. This system will give you a different technological progression every single playthrough. Second, the incorporation of a specialization on top of a passive increase means there's more opportunity to generate a unique game experience. As I'm conceptualizing it, the passive increases over time for most westernized nations should get your nation to about this technology level. Any technologies that you want to have past this point, and of course if you're trying to catch up as a uh, less developed nation, um, that's going to be through your specialization. Which means that over the course of a game, you're not going to have enough time to max out everything. You might pick two or three different categories to max out, but you're going to have to specialize your nation in some number of ways. But the idea here is to force nations to specialize themselves in different ways. You want to specialize yourself for colonization? Well, you're going to be behind somewhere else. You want to specialize yourself for prestige? Well, somewhere else you're going to be falling behind. You want to have the best army in the world? Well, you're going to be falling behind somewhere else. And really, this is just a question of where you as a player choose to invest your research. And finally, there are some additional possibilities here. This tree represents the Victoria 2 tech tree with the various inventions, but there's no reason it has to look this way. There's no reason these lines have to be so linear. And in fact, these branch points can have branch points of their own, so different inventions and prerequisites can branch off in various ways. And really, I think this is just up to the creativity of whoever is designing the tech system. I talked previously about how I'd love to see different types of equipment both in the army and in the navy, and these can be different branch points of their own. Uh, just like you have in Hoi 4 where you have a different ship hull and then the inventions off of that hull. Of course, coming up with equivalent branch types for industry and culture might be a bit tricky, but it can be done. And as I've said, this is my latest iteration of what I would like to see in the tech system, but I think it would be a pretty solid system. That is a passive increase for each of your five categories, randomized between the different techs and inventions that are currently available. And uh, with you being able to further specialize your nation by focusing your research into the various areas as you see fit. Number 29. Colonization. As inspired by Toy 4. The main problem that I have with Victoria 2's colonization system is that it operates more like EU4's colonization system, which is basically the first person to get to an area and plant their flag uh, gets the territory. 
And of course, there are fights over colonies, but really it's just a question of who can send more people. And that's not quite how colonization worked during this era, at least not as I understand it, and not in the most significant and hotly contested places, certainly. So for example, Northern Siberia, sure, sending people up there in small groups to colonize it, planting your flag, that makes a lot of sense. In North America, I think this makes less sense, um, but you know, you could still kind of make an argument for it. But in Africa, no, definitely not. Um, this is not how things worked in the colonization of Africa. So I think basically we need two different colonization systems. One which is unique to those areas where you're just sending in groups of people, planting a flag and claiming an area, you know, Central Australia, New Zealand, sure. And then a completely different system for the scramble for Africa. In doing some quick research, there were 14 nations present at the Congress of Berlin. In Victoria II terms, this is all the primary and secondary powers, which, you know, makes sense as far as colonization is concerned. This wasn't a contest of whoever gets their first wins. This was an actual partition. And I'm not going to load it up and show it because I don't have a game at that stage right now, but basically what I'm looking at is something like the Hoi 4 peace deal system. And the idea would be that if you have the most points, then you make the first pick, and then on down the list. So basically you have uh, nations in order of colonial points, and I don't have a list right now, but we could just pretend. Um, UK goes first, so they get first pick. They pick one colony, and then the next nation with the second most number of points, let's say France or something, it picks a colony, and then on down the list, until every single nation that has points has selected a colony. And different colonies would have different point values, so obviously you can't take something that's worth more than the points that you have. But uh, after every single nation gets one pick, then we go back to the top again. So UK gets the first pick of round two, and on down the list. Until every single colony is selected, or until everyone runs out of points. And then just like in Hoi 4, once you run out of points, you pass, you get some more points back based on how many you started with. And what I'm looking at here is that the Congress of Berlin should be like a game-stopping event, a major moment in Victoria 2, which is just not what happens in actual Victoria 2. In Victoria 2, it's whoever can uh, start dropping as many colonies as quickly as possible um, either gets all the colonies or blocks everyone else out. And it's just a really awkward system, especially when you have like four nations competing for one. In multiplayer, I think it's particularly uninteresting because you have a nation like UK that just has so many free colonial points that um, they'll outcompete one group of players and then use the freed up points to outcompete everyone else. And uh, I, I just don't think that's an interesting system. I think an actual negotiated partition, which is what happened in real life, and uh, really what I think should be happening in Victoria 3 is what we should see. Now, that's just one way that I think it could occur. What I don't like is the Hoy system of the person with the most points selecting everything and then going to the next person. I don't think that would be a good system because in that case you'd have like some cheesy UK just decides to take the entire coastline and then no one else can get anything else. No, I think it should be one pick at a time, top down. So UK gets first pick, whoever's next gets second pick, and on down, and then UK gets first pick of round two and so on. In addition to that, I think you should be able to challenge someone else's pick. If someone else has picked some land that you want, I think you should be able to, uh, say, pay double the amount of colonial points to take that pick back and uh, make it your own. So there would be some competition for individual provinces, and if someone's trying to be cheesy, uh, you know, other people could block it and so on. That's, of course, uh, one possible way that it could work. But I would like to see this as an actual negotiated partition, unlike the true scramble that it is in Victoria 2. And with that, I guess I've reached the end of the list. Conclusions. And now that I've presented my design ideas for Victoria 3, I'm sure there are going to be things that people will disagree with, and that's fine. If there's one thing you get from this video, it's don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And this goes all the way back to the early Paradox games. Victoria 2 is a great game. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty amazing game. Please don't gut the things that make it amazing. Furthermore, across all the various Paradox games, you got little pieces of the puzzle, features and unique aspects here and there, some of which have been forgotten to time. I strongly recommend going back and looking at these old games and see what's different and unique about them, because if you take these little puzzle pieces and you put them together, you could create an absolutely phenomenal game experience. And with that, I've got a ton of editing to do because this has taken ages to record. Thanks for watching, and have a good one.